Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Uh, a while back, I did a video regarding the Civil Conservation Corps 329 Company Camp S51, the South Mountain Camp. And I mentioned the name of a group that did a lot of work in that area during 1941 through 1945 when it was renamed to Camp Michaud. In that video, I said I would not go down the rabbit hole about a specific group I mentioned and it has been a tickle in my mind ever since. So today, we're gonna scratch that itch and learn more about P.O. Box 1142. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. Starting in 1943, the United States established 175 prisoner of war branch camps. And they were serving 511 prisoner of war area camps and processing nearly half a million POWs on US soil. And these numbers only represent the camps we actually knew about. In Pennsylvania, there were 32 secret POW camps created to serve high-profile POW targets. These camps usually carried the name of the area they were built in in order to use the tactic of hiding in plain sight. Names like Camp New Cumberland, Indian Town Gap Reservation, Toby Hanna Reservation, Valley Forge General Hospital, and well, Camp Michaud which is where our focus is for this video. The camp in 1942 was called the Pine Grove Furnace Internment Camp. In the beginning of 1943, the designation of the camp completely changed to a special purpose and any instructions pertaining thereto camp, being renamed to Pine Grove Prisoner of War Camp. Now, again, we're talking about prisoner of war camps, where there were 175 branch camps for large numbers of POWs, 511 area camps for ranked soldiers, and in PA, 32 secret camps specifically for extremely high ranked prisoners and prisoners who would be considered high value targets. Of those 32 secret camps, Camp Michaud was one found in the middle of nowhere far from anyone or anything and located deep in a valley at the beginning of the Allegheny Mountain Range, a range that you should be familiar with now that we have shown historically how difficult it is to traverse and has played a significant part in the engineering evolution of transportation. You may be asking yourself why Michaud, or more accurately, the Pine Grove Prisoner of War Camp, was such an important location for prisoners. Well. That answer leads back to it being in a location far from any attempts at POW rescue. It was so far from the ocean. It was difficult at best to attempt to bomb being in the Allegheny Range of the Appalachian Mountain Range. Oh, and did I mention that it's only two and a half hour drive from Alexandria, Virginia? One hour as the crow flies. What's the significance of being that close to Alexandria, Virginia, right next to Washington, D.C.? Well, that was the home of Camp Hush Hush. You know, Camp Confidential. Come on, people. You know IPW in Fort Hunt? IPW? Interrogation of Prisoners of War? The home of the Ghost Army. P.O. Box 1142? Okay. Maybe you don't know. Since the beginning of War is Immemorial, the art of war is often found through the process of secrets and deception. World War II was no different, with maybe the exception of the war being more secrets than any other war previous. Found just south of Alexandria in a historic location known as Fort Hunt, which was built as part of the harbor defense of the Potomac during the Endicott period of our military history, where the Endicott period is so named because it was spearheaded by Secretary of War William C. Endicott under President Grover Cleveland from 1890 through 1910, with the mission of fortifying the safety of 29 locations along the U.S. coastline. 
because, well, the country was being run by Grover Cleveland, who was afraid of the rumors of war from other nations. So he had a military policy of self-defense and modernization. And the U.S. had not addressed their state of equipment since the early 1870s, which were extremely outdated, even in the 1870s, compared to Europe. From 1898 until 1918, on the event of World War I, Fort Hunt was nothing more than a half-forgotten peacetime garrison and officially ended its life as a garrison, so the batteries could be used elsewhere. After World War I, the site became an educational facility for soldiers with 30 service schools. In 1921, during a reorganization, it became home to the Military Finance School and in 1922 was also home to the U.S. Army band Pershing's own. In 1923, the U.S. Army Band ended up moving to the Washington Barracks, which later became Fort McNair, and the financial school shifted directly into offices in D.C., which means from 1923 until 1932, Fort Hunt sat as an abandoned post. But in 1932, it was given over to the Office of Public Buildings and Public Parks of the National Capitol and was to be turned into a recreational site and it became home to Civil Conservation Corps and P-6. When World War II came around in 1941, there was a desperate need for military government property, especially for housing and interrogating prisoners of war. A transfer of Fort Hunt was granted to the War Department by the National Park Services, not to exceed one year post-conflict before it was to be transferred back to Parks and Recreation. CCC NP6 was booted out of the site. Within three short months, the site was heavily secured physically and in name and purpose, being turned into a top secret intelligence operation for interrogating German prisoners of war. The new installation had 150 buildings, extremely high guard towers, electric fences, and was kept so secret that the buildings on the blueprints were labeled officer school during the building process in order to keep the contractors in the dark about their purpose. The site became home to all aspects of secrecy and the Ghost Army of World War II. The Ghost Army was comprised of highly intelligent military recruits who initially served as servicemen until they were given a compulsory choice to join a secret branch of the military. This branch had many different groups within it, but the common theme of all the groups was deception. And we're not talking about just lying to people. We're talking about becoming a voluntary mole in the enemy military, spreading propaganda, spreading false propaganda, building devices to fool the enemy, and performing psyops during interrogation of prisoners of war. The 23rd Headquarters Special Troops and the 31st 33rd D Signal Service Corps was to build visual, sonic, and radio deception, including things like inflatable tanks to fool Germans' air reconnaissance. Project X-Ray made weird and strange weapons, like the bat bombs, where a bomb container full of bats with incendiary devices on their bodies were dropped over Japan in order to have the bats fly to all the wooden paper built houses and catch all the towns, cities, and farms on fire. The spy masters group would be trained on spycraft and prepped for deployment behind enemy lines. The code breakers would work tirelessly, cracking all the different manners in which the Germans were encrypting their messages and manners in which they sent messages. Then there was a group that even the other Ghost Army members didn't really know anything about on the same base as they were. A group so secret that it referred to itself as POB 1142, or as the internets and non-investigative historians call it, PO Box 1142. POB 1142 had two currently known branches, the Army's Military Intelligence Service X-Wing and Y-Wing, or more commonly, MIS-X and MIS-Y. 
Although not formally a part of the POB 1142, the Navy ONI, or Office of Naval Intelligence, did play a lesser role in activities regarding captured naval POWs and non-naval POW transports from Europe. The secret group MISX were the escape and evasion activities of prisoners of war group and would build all sorts of secret devices and find ways to help our POWs in Germany escape or in many cases get captured and remain in a stalag with the intent of performing espionage and information collecting similar to what is found in the movie Stalag 17 or the TV sitcom Hogan's Heroes both of which are actually considered by progressive media moguls, and I quote, an absurd notion that a band of saboteurs could operate out of a prisoner of war camp in Germany, which is what we did successfully, and did often to excessively great extents during the war. So MISX made things like shaving brushes, combs, soap, razors, smoking items, other tobacco products, sporting goods, shoes, uniforms, small games, all which would include pieces of equipment for making radios, bombs, maps, cameras, you name it, and they somehow hid that stuff in those products. MISX also created and recruited the Red Cross to deliver the items to the prisoners. Then there was the group that relates back to Michaud in Pennsylvania and the Pine Grove Prisoners of War Camp, MISY, the other side of the coin to MISX. This group was created to interrogate prisoners of war through multiple departments such as enemy intelligence, army weapons, air weapons, scientific research, industrial economics, and the Navy's ONI. What's funny is that when you research these groups on the internet, TPTB, or the powers that be, are slowly erasing information and changing the definition of terms or using softer language to describe the purpose of these organizations. The fact is, MISY was an interrogation group, no different than those who perform waterboarding to extract information today. The powers that be now likes to refer to groups like these as people who, whose duty was to interview POWs. So make sure you use your brain if you research these groups and use historical knowledge of what we do when referencing what we once did. And remember, we can be really cruel and unusual when we want or need to be. I mean, this was a world war, not a family get together on a holiday weekend. Because it's popular in today's world to culturally appropriate in order to virtue signal about where you stand on social or political issues that you were not ever present to witness nor participate in, it's important to know how manipulative we were during World War II prisoner of war interrogations. Before being shipped down to POB 1142, many prisoners were pre-interrogated at the secret POW camps in Pennsylvania. In order to perform this, people who spoke German fluently were highly required not because they would better understand the language, but because they would also catch verbal cues and clues from the prisoner they were interrogating. In the United States, just before the war, we had a sudden and large influx of refugees from Germany. Nazi party sentiment in the United States was very popular during this time and made up for a good part of how Americans saw themselves in agreement with what Germany was initially doing. Yes, it would probably make your head explode to know that a good 45 to 50 percent of U.S. citizens were pro-Nazi and were members of the American Nazi Party or the German-American Bund. Even famous people like Charles Lindbergh and Walt Disney. Although if you try to look up these former members of the aforementioned political parties, you'll run into the PSYOP and disinformation campaign being run by big tech and other sub-government groups claiming that no they weren't or how people today automatically associate the word Nazi with racist and well you know how that ends up in this fake mass media world we have today. Hopefully this won't cause an issue for the AI algorithm at YouTube and get this video banned because these weak people of smooth brains can't handle the truth. But 
This information, all of it, is historical fact. Back to our realization that we, as humans, were not and are not saints. So as it would turn out, during World War II, we did not have a lot of Americans who spoke German fluently enough and could be trusted to do the interrogations. Similarly, only about half of the German immigrants were expatriates or expats, so we couldn't trust them not to feel sympathy for the people whom the prisoners of war were to be interrogated. That leaves us with one group whom emigrated and could be fully trusted to do the job of interrogation, the German Jew. And that is whom we chose to perform most of the interrogations. After initial trials of violent and forceful interrogation methods proved to be fruitless, the methods of interrogation shifted. The POWs were given nearly anything they wanted in order to make their stay more comfortable essentially anything except for freedom. This limit of grant was so extreme that they had free roam of the camp, swimming pools, exercise equipment, tennis courts. It was more of a life of a person at a retreat than a prison, with the exception again of freedom. Any attempt at escape was met with zero tolerance and the person was shot dead on the spot. Within these camps were microphones, hundreds of microphones, all constantly recording every conversation and even anything you said in your sleep, complete with a building where U.S. soldiers were transcribing the conversation and handing them off to agents of POB 1142. Some interrogators became what are called stool pigeons and would act as a captured German Nazi to garner information from their fellow prisoners and had to learn everything they could to truly pull off acting as if they really were captured German infantrymen. Others would sit with the POW and have small talk, play some board games and reminisce about pre-war Germany or Austria. Actual information obtained included troop movements, V1 and V2 rocket weapon construction and usage, the secret location in Peenemunde, the island of Usedom, more commonly referred to as Sunny Island or Berlin's bathtub, where the V2 was being developed and built. Information even led to the Kriegsmarine type XBU boat named U-234, whose first and only mission was the delivery of uranium oxide and advanced weapons technology to the Japanese empire. <laughs> Oddly enough, it's neat to see the Nazi Sicherheitsdienst, the original SS, not to be confused with the other SS, the Schutzstaffel, had a sense of comparable humor to our Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, when it came to naming things. It just so happened that the name of the U-boat, U-234, is the same name as the end product created from processing the uranium oxide they carried which is the uranium isotope 234, more commonly called U-234. And that, that is how we learned about troop movements, weapon development, belief systems, psyops, and more information to help our cause in the war. Of the estimated 3,000 POWs that were interrogated by POB 1142, over 1,500 of them came out of the Pine Grove prisoner of war camp. Early on, this camp became the location where any and all POWs who were captured from a submarine or were a high-ranking leader stayed and were pre-interrogated and softened for the agents of POB 1142. At the wane of the European theater portion of the war, the camp switched over to bringing in hundreds of POWs and defecting scientists, military figures, and political figures. When the European theater came to a close, the camp switched over to processing the Japanese using the same process as was done with the Germans. In 1946, post-war situations quickly turned into Cold War operations against our now former Russian ally. Yes, the Cold War with the United Soviet Socialist Republic started immediately after our European withdrawal at the end of 1946. This brought about the creation of Operation Paperclip. When Operation Paperclip started, the use and purpose of the camps came to an abrupt close with the exception of POB 1142, 
which changed gears and became a recruiting station for post-war assets. Although the interrogations of these assets continued at POB 1142, their induction took place over multiple locations such as Fort Strong in Boston and other repurposed locations. The significance of these post-interrogations was mainly reprogramming and indoctrination in competition with Russia. And when we say asset, we're talking the likes of Werner von Braun, who became head of the Marshall Space Flight Center of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. Another interesting asset was General Reinhard Galen, who was the head of the German Fremdehira Ost, or FHO, which was the intelligence agency of the SS that worked on Russian information, ultimately providing the U.S. with more information regarding the Soviet bloc than we ever could have imagined. By the end of 1946, the property of POB 1142 and Fort Hunt was turned over to the Army Corps of Engineers for demolition. In January of 1948, as agreed upon by the initial contract, the property was handed back over to the National Park Services who converted what was left into a public use park. And that was the end of POB 1142. Or was it? If you learned anything new or like the information you watched here, help support a creator by telling people about this video and share it out. Help the channel stay alive by donating to the Odyssey over on Patreon or PayPal. Show me how much you like the channel by stopping by the merch store, picking out something you like, and sending me a picture that I can add to a collage that will be shown on the After Show Live videos. Give the video a like or dislike, and let me know if you want more content like this. Leave a comment about what you thought of this video, or of other ideas you'd like to see come to life here. Subscribe to receive notifications of when a new video has been released. And if you're still here, why not check out this video about what started the quest to tell you about POB 1142, Camp Michaud. As always, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.